Well, we're continuing our series on rebuilding a broken culture from the book of Nehemiah. Rebuilding a broken culture from the book of Nehemiah, where he is rebuilding broken Jerusalem. The walls have been broken down. The people are in apathy. Conditions are terrible. Last time we left in chapter 5, where he has to deal with injustice, economic injustice, among the people. They were robbing each other, creating illegitimate debt, illegitimate, ungodly payday loan interest rates, and he has to fix it because that's what leadership does. It identifies wrong and seeks to make it right. He leads them in a self-maledictory oath. That's where we ended last time, where the people say they will give back what they had illegitimately taken. In verse 13, he says, I shook out the front of my garment Thus, may God shake out every man from his house and from his possessions who does not fulfill this promise. Just as he shook his garment, it meant God was going to shake loose the benefits that they had in their lives because of their unjust and unjust ways. It's a self-maledictory oath. We've all probably made it where we said, God, if you, if you get me out of this, if I don't do right, well, we need to get straight with God when we do that because we have called down God's dis discipline in our own lives. So, he's now governor. And as governor, he wants to make sure that he's operating with integrity. So he did not use all the allowances given to him, verse 14. There were certain rights and privileges he had as governor, but he didn't do it. He says, I, at the end of verse 14, nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. One of the ways you discipline yourself is not to take care of all the advantages that may be available to you just because you can. And he says, the reason is motivation. Verse 15, the end of it, I did not do so because of the fear of God. To fear God, remember, means to take God seriously, not casually. It means, doesn't mean to walk around trembling. It means to seriously regard him and his perspectives on life. So he applies himself, verse 16, to the work he's been called to do and to finish that task. Verse 19, remember me, O my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. I want to pause there for a moment. Because he asked God to remember him for good. Let me tell you, did you know you can do that? Your good works can never save you, but your good works can reward you. Your good works can't get you to heaven, but your good works can get heavenly benefits to you on earth and get you more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Because works, once you are saved, get your reward. You don't work to get saved but you work because you are saved in order to gain a reward. So he asked God to remember him. So I want to encourage all of you to, to do as many good works as God opens up the opportunity for you to do, which means doing things that benefit others without expecting anything in return. That's what our acts of kindness cards mean, that you do good works. You do good works in the community for the poor, for the homeless, good works for the police by men and women, law enforcement who are doing good work for the sanitation workers, whatever it is within your hand, and then say, God, remember me. Because one of the reasons we need him to remember us is to override some bad works we've done, right? So let's be a church and a people of good works. He comes to chapter 6 where there is a plot against him. Why? Because God doesn't want to, uh, uh, the enemy of God, Satan, doesn't want to see God's people's progress, particularly in rebuilding lives, and in this case, rebuilding a broken community. They're now at the end. The doors are the last thing to go up, verse 6, verse 1 says. I had not set up the doors and the gates. So they've rebuilt the wall, now it's time to get the doors so that now we can lock folk out who don't belong here. So uh, it's, it's, he's at a critical place. Well, remember Sam Ballard and Gisham sent message saying, come to meet with us because they were planning to harm me. 
So they were trying to discourage him. They were trying to criticize him. Now they want to hurt him. Uh, they want to meet in the plain of oh no, verse 2 says. Guess what Nehemiah says? He says, oh no, to a meeting in oh no. Okay, I like that play on words. They said, meet us in oh no. And he said, oh no, <laughs> I'm not going there, okay? Because God was covering him. He was protecting him. So he says, I can't stop, verse 3, the work that God has called me to do. Here's the principle. You don't leave the will of God. You don't leave the will of God to do things that are outside of the will of God. You don't leave the will of God. Once you think about leaving the will of God, you're placing yourself in the vicinity of the enemy who wants to dissuade you or harm you. And so he will not go. So they devise another strategy, verse 5. It is the strategy of the open letter. What is the open letter? It's the letter that any and everybody wants to read. It's the letter in the newspaper. What is the content of this letter? Verse 6. It is reported among the nations, and Gashmuth says, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall, and you are to be their king, according to these reports. You have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah, and now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So now, come now, let us take counsel together. You know what we call this? Fake news. <laughs> this is as fake as you can get it. They send an open letter with the wrong news, impugning his character and his motives. We're sending the word out that you're doing all this as a power grab. You want to make your name great, you want to take over, and you want to be your own king over your own kingdom. You're rebelling against the king in Persia who sent you here. They were impugning his character. They were trying to ruin his name with an open letter. What were they trying to do? It says, I sent the message, such things you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. So he didn't ignore it. He responded to it. It's okay to respond to wrong. And he did it legitimately. He did it peacefully, but he did it clearly. He says, that's a lie. That's fake news. For all of them were trying to frighten us. They're trying to stir us, right? They will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Remember, Nehemiah is a praying man. He keeps going to God. You know why? Because he's getting a little scared. They sent to frighten us because the enemy will scare you. But he allows his fear to drive him to God, not drive him to acquiesce to his enemy. And so, so he's resisting the threats. There's physical threats. There is character assassination. He keeps the work going while trusting in the Lord. So now we got another problem, verse 10. A false prophet. Shemaiah. They say, well, look, he's not going to fall for this political stuff. So let's get him on the religious side. Verse 10 says, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you and they are going to kill you at night. But I said, should a man like me flee and could, such, could one such as I go into the temple to save his life, I will not go in. In other words, am I going to use the church, the temple, as a place to run into and not do what I've been called to do. You know, many people do that. They, do, they use going to church as an excuse for not fill, fulfilling the will of God. Being religious should be no excuse for not doing what God has called you and me to do. Okay? Now, the temple was critical. Ezra was there to rebuild the temple. The temple was central to the life in Israel, but for you to leave the temple to do the will of God, to do the work that God has called you to do. Now, verse 12 is a critical principle for rebuilding your life, but also rebuilding the community because now religion is being reused. And by the way, I'm surprised 
at how many people in our culture today are using God's name illegitimately. It's called false prophets. Using illegitimate use of God's name to enhance their godless agenda. Just because God's name is being utilized and just because a prophet is being quoted doesn't make it authentic. It has to be authentic because it is supported by the word of God and by the spirit of God. How do we know when the spirit of God comes in? Verse 12, then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Well, here's the way that you know somebody's a false prophet. How does money fit into it? Okay. They hired him. Any preacher who's for hire, we're not talking about a salary for a job. We're talking about hired to work against the will of God. Okay? They are, they, they, they can be bought. They can be bought. I remember the time when we were building our church and the builders wanted the job and they called me to their office in private. And they said, if you give us the job, here's what we will do. We will put $250,000 in your personal bank account as a gift to you for you helping us to get the job. They wanted to buy me and my influence for, uh, uh, for their job. And uh, so, of course, they, we turned it down, but they wanted to make me a preacher for hire. The Bible says a servant is worthy of his hire. That's not the problem. The problem is when you're for hire, okay? He says, absolutely not. They were hired for, the, I was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act according to and sin so that they might have an evil report in order that they could, uh, they could reproach me. They could give me a bad name. They could say, we bought this preacher. <laughs> we bought this, we, 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 we bought this leader and he's not a preacher. He's a, he's, a, he's a man in business. He works for the government. Remember, he's the governor. He's, a, he's the administrator for uh, uh, the, 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 the king of, of Persia. So not only are preachers not to be bought, but businessmen are not to be bought. Businesswomen are not to be bought. Politicians, if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to be viable. People should not be able to purchase your integrity with their money to purchase your character just for a few dollars more. What we need are people in leadership, in this case, a man in government, of high character financially, but also who knows how to get the work done. He's out there not just, not just talking a good game, he's out there getting the work done. We find ourselves in dilemmas. We find some people can do the work, but don't have character. Other people who have character who can't do the work. We got, we got all stuff. So, so, so we, you need both. And so he's not for hire. So what does he say? He says, remember me, O God. Tobiah and Sabalas, according to these words, words uh, works of theirs. Remember me. In other words, bless me because I stood true to your word. You, it's okay to ask God to reward you for your faithfulness. It's okay. You can't work to get to heaven, but you can work for the rewards that heaven offers in time and in eternity. So here is the good news. Verse 15. The wall was completed in 52 days. Say what? 52 days. Wait a minute, this wall had been down for over 100 years and it gets rebuilt in 52 days. Why? Because when you're in God's will, doing it God's way, based on God's word and trusting God's person, it doesn't take that long to solve the race crisis, the injustice crisis, the police and community crisis, and whatever crisis we face. Our problem is it takes too long for us to get around to doing it God's way and God will not skip our decision making. Now he can overrule it when he sovereignly chooses to, but he normatively 
honors our decision making, even when our decisions are not his decisions. Okay? So that's a principle we need to know. But the opposition was still there. When our enemies heard of it, verse 16, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost confidence, for they recognized that the work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Also in those days many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by the oath to him because he was the son of the law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. So they had entered into false covenants. But yet the word had gotten out. Something's going on over there. They're doing something right over there. And God is with them. You know our problem in our communities? God is not with us anymore because we insist on doing it according to our own understanding, trying to solve these problems by human ingenuity void of spiritual direction. But they still sent letters, verse 19, to frighten me. So even though they were seeing what God had done and even acknowledging it, they were still trying to stop it. Chapter 7. In chapter 7, we have the enemy still trying to harm. But he still is doing the work of rebuilding. So he identifies his leadership team, including his brother, Hanani, because his brother was a faithful man who feared God, verse 2 says. That's what you want. You want people who take God seriously and whom you can trust. Okay? They take God seriously and whom you can depend on. Faithful. Faithful means they're not here today and gone tomorrow. They're in for the long haul. Sometimes we have one extreme. People who don't fear God but who like to do the work or people who, who, uh, who love the Lord, but they won't get the work done. No, he was dependable. And so the work kept going on. So it is absolutely critical that we keep going with the right kind of people to do the job God has called us to do. They're in a large city, verse 4. It's spacious, but we have a problem. In it were, uh, but the people in it were few and the houses were not built. Everybody had moved to the suburbs, right? Because the city was a disgrace. The city was torn down. The community was in disrepair. So nobody wanted to live in those neighborhoods anymore. They had already moved out. They moved to a more secure location because the city was in ruin. So few people we're living there. So what does he do? Well, this boring next section, verse 6 and following, he takes a register of everybody who God had set free from captivity. Okay, everybody who had moved out to the suburbs, everybody who had been blessed by the best, everybody who had seen God's hand, he has a record. All those boring names, Please notice how many times the words sons and men show up. Sons and men, not because the women weren't critical, but because the men were responsible. The men were responsible for setting the agenda, for getting this city rebuilt, for getting the families restabilized. And so as a result, God puts in his mind what he was to do because now that the walls were built, the people needed to be rebuilt. Because if the people are not rebuilt, they're going to just break down new walls. You don't just need new housing, you need new kind of people living in them so that the housing and the economy and the businesses stay stable. I love verse 5 of chapter 7, then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles. See, when you're obeying the written word, the Holy Spirit can put in your heart the next move that you make to strategically fix a problem. 
you operate on the written word and then the Holy Spirit gives you ideas, thoughts, perspectives about the strategy because strategies change that you use to get the job done. And so he does that. Few people living in the city. He puts an idea in his mind to identify the senses of the people. Who are the people that we're going to use to regentrify this community? To bring skills back and jobs back and economy back and housing back and create just opportunities because he's dealt with the injustice there as well. I love how this chapter concludes. He says in verses 70 to 73, they brought economic, economics back, verse 70. Some of the heads of father's households gave to the treasury. So they're putting, they're reinvesting. The priests, the Levites, these are the leaders. Because when you do it God's way, he knows how to fund rebuilding of communities. Now, this is going to lead next time to chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the beast. It's where you want to go. I want you to read it and reread it because this is the revival chapter. So read chapters 8, 9, and 10 for next time as we continue rebuilding a broken culture, but read chapter 8 twice and see what it takes spiritually if your rebuilding is going to stick and not just be there for a short amount of time as we continue our teaching on rebuilding a broken culture. Enjoy your discussion questions, enjoy your small groups, and enjoy meeting some new friends as you're guided now into your Zoom gatherings. God bless.